Danielle, we ready to go live? Yes. Okay, good evening, uh, all of you, uh, and very much welcome uh, to this, our fourth Hans Van Balen Town Hall meeting, aimed at really uh, collaborating with you uh, on the Conference on the Future of Europe to give you as citizens and members of the FDP an opportunity to have your input uh, into this um, really important event that's taking place. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, even if we're online, uh, our, it's still uh, an opportunity, as I said, to engage with you. Um, we're here today to discuss mainly uh, the issues around um, the, the Conference on the Future of Europe. And it's an opportunity for those of us that are involved in politics, both nationally and internationally, to listen uh, to what you have to say and what matters most to you uh, from a European perspective. Now, we have an interesting little aside today. We're joined by Mina Wellen, who's an artist, who will be producing a digital illustration of the event, which will be shared at the end of the event. So I'm just going to go through some of the house rules initially um, to talk to you a little bit about how we intend uh, to run this event. Um, it's fully in English. Uh, even though I must say some of the panellists were conversing in German uh, while we were waiting to go live. So that now has to end, Nicola and others. Um, unfortunately, we're not in a position to uh, provide you with translation. Um, a colleague of ours from the ALDE Secretariat will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A function throughout the event. So uh, we, will be, we will be keeping in touch with you. We want you to use the Q&A function on Zoom to write your question uh, or comment. Uh, we'll also try to get as many uh, interventions via video as possible from you, the audience. So please use chat to ask for the password uh, and we'll provide you with it and it will allow you to send on uh, a video, a little video Snapchat uh, to us so that we can try to bring that to you. Um, please ensure then that your microphone and video work correctly uh, and that you have your name and country visible when, 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 when that's happening. Um, now, I just want to initially present uh, the co-hosts of the event, um, Ilhan Kritschev, who's an MEP uh, and the acting vice president of the Aldi party, together with uh, Alexander Graf Lambsdorff, I'm of the FDP and the vice president of the Aldi party. Um, I think uh, certainly Alexander needs no introduction uh, to, your, to your audience. So, uh, Ilhan, can I ask you just to offer some opening remarks for maybe four to five minutes, if you would, please. Great, great, uh, Timmy. Thank you so much. And uh, liebe, liebe Nicola, liebe Alexander, liebe Helmut, uh, thank you for uh, all for being here, even though we would have work for all of us to be with you in Berlin. We'll still have many opportunities to see each other face to face very soon. We are here for a fourth town hall meeting on the future of Europe, named after the late president uh, Hans van Baren, the great European who was immensely passionate about this issue. We are doing this town hall to put European citizens at the center of debate on the future of Europe. This is about you, the citizens. Only with the citizens we can bring this uh, continent forward. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank our host, the FDP, as well our uh, great panelists. As we all know, the FDP holds a special place within the Aldi family. Not only are they a founding party, but they also have achieved tremendous success in the latest elections and hold key government ministers such as finance, uh, digital and transport, education and justice, and all of uh, this during the leadership of Christian Lindner. But above, above all, I want to thank all of you who are here online. Your presence here is vital to build a better Europe. We liberals deeply believe in cooperation and an open exchange of ideas. It is in our DNA. This is what the Alde party has always stood for. To quote great German uh, liberal predict uh, Naumann, who said that the fledgling de uh, democratic system to succeed, we need citizens who understand and pro uh, pro uh, the procedures, believe in democratic rules and get personal involvement. This is what we are doing today. The Conference on the Future of Europe is once in a generation chance to shape the Europe we want to live in. Germany's challenges are no different 
to the ones uh, uh, the rest of Europe is facing today. Whether it's, it is uh, a COVID-19 pandemic, a more assertive Russia, digitalization, or threats against uh, the very core of our European democracy. None of these issues can be dealt uh, with by Germany alone. They also cannot be fixed by Europe without Germany. Let me say it in uh, plainly uh, as I can. Russia's current actions are unacceptable and remind us our security must never be taken for granted. This is why we must once and for all create a true European defense union under the parliamentary control. The safety of our citizens must never be taboo. We desperately need a fully functioning digital single market. We are missing out of 450 billion euros every year by not finishing to build what we started. But uh, digital isn't only about money. How many Pegasus, uh, spyware scandals will uh, we endure before we do something about it? Tackling cybersecurity is an essential pillar for protecting our democracies. Not only do we condemn the misuse of surveillance uh, tools, but we must blacklist the companies that owns the spyware, the NSEO group. What is illegal uh, offline must be not tolerated online. We saw how important this was during the first months of the pandemic. The Digital Service Act is a step in the right direction. And on European dem democracy, more broadly, quite simply, we have more work to do, to talk more about Europe and to make sure that work that happens in Brussels not just remains in Brussels increase visibility and activity that benefits citizens, break down the rhetorical walls, increase partnerships with national parliaments, and yes, even introduce transnational lists for the European elections. Let us not waste a historic opportunity as we move forward with these discussions today. Let us reflect uh, on the fact this conference is about the Europe we want to leave for our children and grandchildren, our prosperity, our well-being, our freedoms are not guaranteed. And with that, I will leave you in a very good hands with our moderator for today, fellow Alde Party co-president Timmy Dury. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilhan. Really appreciate your comments. Uh, and now to uh, our joint uh, colleague Alexander Lambsdorff who, as you know, is an MEP, but is also a vice president uh, of ALDE, uh, who contributes uh, very regularly to our, to our bureau activities. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing his contribution. So Alexander, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Timmy. It's good to see you all. It's really great to uh, interact, to see how so many people online also are participating. Um, one thing, I'm no longer an MEP. <laughs> I'm an oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> but I loved being an MEP. For 13 years, I served in the European Parliament. And I'm seeing Nicola here also, who's my successor in the uh, European Parliament as head of the German delegation and also a vice president. So it's, it's a wonderful institution, the European Parliament. Uh, um, but uh, Timmy, just like you, I'm I'm a humble national parliamentarian, um, so there you go. It's uh, Ilhan and Nicola uh, who are holding up the European uh, level here. Um, let, let's, we have a really exciting topic, I, I have to say. Uh, democracy at the European level. How can we rethink democracy in, 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 in so many ways? Is it necessary really to do that? Uh, do we, uh, you know, are we faced with a crisis of democracy? Um, and I think... Um, you know, that question in the European context has an additional dimension. Is there a crisis of democracy? And what does it mean for European democracy? So this is going to be a very exciting evening. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, in my view, in my view, those people who challenge the EU as our organization of liberalism and democracy at a transnational level, um, you know, some people say, well, that cannot work. 
I think we're proving them wrong day by day. I mean, the European Union, for all its flaws and, 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 and idiosyncrasies, is still the world's largest experiment in uh, transnational governments, in liberal democracy at the supranational level. It's unique. It's attractive. We have developed our European way of life in uh, on our continent, which is diverse and heterogeneous and tolerant as well as it should be. Um, but, 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 but that is something we stand out as an example to, to many other regions of the world. Now, we are being challenged, obviously. We're challenged, we are being challenged from outside. Ilhan just mentioned the actions of Russia, uh, uh, the, the pressure that's being exerted on Ukraine. Ukraine is a country that's also undergoing lots of you know, transitions and difficult uh, situations. But it's a country that has seen one peaceful election after the other with a peaceful transfer of power. That is something that our friends in Russia have not seen in a very long time. So democracy is seen by the Russians as something that's right on their threshold and apparently is thought of as a threat. Um, I believe that um, it's, it's these authoritarian forces in, in, in a number of countries that you know, attack democracies through disinformation, through fake news, um, and, 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 and try to weaken the fabric of democratic societies. We must be aware of this. As Democrats, we are a provocation to others, but we are the path to liberty, decency, dignity, and a, a good life for, for, for our citizens. So it's, it's really important that we defend it. And also against enemies from within. It's not just challenges from outside. It's also challenges from the inside. Um, there, we have some member states where we have a worrying development over the last couple of years. If you think of Hungary, Poland, partly even Slovenia, uh, Malta, we have, we have issues. I mean, there's not a single European member state that is a perfect democracy because by definition, a democracy can never be perfect. It is always work in progress. It will always need people who, who work on its, its improvement. But we have some countries where clearly uh, we have a very, very negative uh, development because populists ha have come to power. They have limited the independence of the media. They have limited the independence of uh, the judiciary. They have ended academic independence. All these things have happened. All these things are happening on our continent. And therefore, it is crucial that we as liberals from the democratic center are clearly aware of the fact that we have a particular responsibility with our colleagues from uh, uh, the democratic spectrum who are not in liberal parties yet, one should say. So what, what comes for, what's the result in, in, in my view for, for our evening here today? I believe the European Union can only be successful as a union of democracies, of countries that are governed by the rule of law, that respect minorities, that have fair electoral systems and representation. I believe we need a sovereign Europe that is capable of acting together, um, that defends our interests and our European way of life in the face of a changing world in which unfriendly actors, to put it diplomatically, unfriendly actors play a very active role against us. So I think this is, this is the mission that we have as liberals. And this is what I would like to discuss with all of you, how we can improve democracy, how we can make it stronger, how we can make it stronger at the European level to make our European Union the beacon of hope for many people inside and outside of our union. Alexander, thank you so much. And my apologies for uh, misrepresentation at the beginning, of course. <laughs> okay, I had, no problem. had returned to national parliament having, having had a very successful uh, career at, at, at European level and of course you were you were drafted back uh, to be part of um, rebuilding the party and, and that you certainly did and you've been been really successful I, I had the pleasure of uh, being in Berlin on the night uh, of your results uh, and I have to say uh, it was well recognized by all concerned the role that you had played in in rebuilding the party so so, uh, but of course, I see you so regularly in Brussels because you're on our bureau. So <laughs> it seems like you've you've had the 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 the, the act of bilocation. You've been in both places and working really hard. So so thanks for for everything that you do there. Um, we're now moving to our first poll. Um, so you're going to have to bear with me because this is something new for me as a moderator to to work through. But I'm I'm reliably informed by the Alde Secretariat who are 
who are minions in the background milling away to make sure that everything will, will work perfectly. So we're, we're using a Mintmer, uh, and as I said, a, a colleague of mine in the Aldi party will share uh, his screen now um, with the question, the instructions uh, involved, and then the results will be displayed on screen. So if you just bear with us while we get that uh, up on screen, and you can see what we're what we're trying to do here. So there's a number of of, of uh, headings: um, jobs, growth, and innovation; climate change and sustainability; emigration and asylum; EU's role in the global stage; EU democracy; rule of law and human rights. So you got to go to www.menti.com on your computer or on your phone. There is a, a poll code, and it's 2473-9913, if that's not visible to you, 2473-9913. And for you, if you just rate what, from your perspective, um, is the, in an order of importance. Okay, so we're, um, we're getting results, okay. Now that seems to me that we've won from each, okay. So I'm going to give a little time for this because uh, you know some people will be logging on from different devices. Um, just I have to say that this is really cool. Yeah. This is nice. It's like it's a live poll. Never seen I like that. Polls. <laughs> Kudos to the Secretariat. Excellent job. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we're still recording votes, so I'm going to leave it open for another couple of minutes. Um, if anybody's having difficulty, you might just, you know, make a comment in the chat box so that we can try to help you if you're having difficulty um, logging in. I'm going to continue to leave it open because the participation is continuing. Um, we're slowly but surely getting more people involved. Um, so thank you for thank you for this. So, so I think I'll, I think I'll just take it at that. We've got a reasonable representation. So, whilst there are a number of other people may vote, I think we've got a good, a good sound base to work on. And what's really interesting is that EU's role on the global stage um, is uh, it seems to be the one which today and within this group, uh, as you can can, can widely see, that's interesting. So, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm just going to leave that as part of the discussion. Um, second, as you can see, is jobs, growth, and innovation. And then there's a tie between climate change, sustainability, and EU democracy. Uh, and very important rule of law is there as well. Immigration and asylum uh, is, is, not, is, not, is, not, is not to the fore on this occasion, but it certainly has been in the past. 
Okay, we'll move along a little bit. Uh, so I want to introduce to you now uh, the speakers uh, and ask them for their opening remarks. Uh, Nicola Beer, who I think many of you will know is a member and vice president of the European Parliament. She's also a federal vice chair uh, of the FDP, uh, or was from 2017 to 2019. Uh, and indeed, she was a member of the Bundestag from 2013 to 2019. And prior to that, she was the general secretary. Really importantly, from the purpose of uh, this conversation, uh, she is a member uh, of the Conference on the Future of Europe Plenary. So it's really important uh, to have her and hear her talk a little bit about uh, what is the state of play right now uh, and what we can expect uh, in the next months, the challenges that, that we face, etc. So Nicola, the floor is all yours and thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. Yeah, thank you, Timmy, and thank you that we are discussing this really, really important topic. Uh, I can subscribe everything what was said by Alexander and Ilhan, Ilhan and Alexander on the necessity uh, first to have a European Union. I mean, if it would not be there, we had to invent it. Uh, and also on the necessity um, to foster uh, our democracies inside and outside. Uh, but I think um, we have now also the opportunity and we have also the, the duty to go further. Uh, and this was also the idea behind the conference on the future of Europe. They thought this is a great role model, but we see that after all these years and destinies, uh, it became a little bit old in a working of the institution. We are too slow. Uh, we are not concise enough, I think, uh, especially, and I mean, for me, it's not a surprise, especially in the question of foreign politics, uh, and common security um, for the future. Um, this is something uh, what get us as liberals an idea before the last European election uh, to put this idea on the table, to have a conference uh, on the future of Europe, uh, to, to show to our citizens that we can reform ourselves. And I mean, uh, we lost a strong partner uh, with Great Britain uh, in the club. And uh, at least this, I think, should be a kickoff to think about why the club maybe is not so attractive as it should be. And so um, we fight through this idea of the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, it was not so a uh, beloved one in the Council. Uh, I mean, of course, it was relay a little bit because um, of the pandemic. Uh, normally, we wanted to start one year earlier. Uh, but uh, now we are going fast forward um, with this conference, uh, even when we have um, a rest to convince the member states that reforming European Union is a sign of strength and not of weakness. Uh, there are a lot of uh, member states hesitating. Uh, I think there is a little bit also the fear that the council as representatives or for the member states could, uh, in the balance of power, uh, a little bit uh, have less power uh, when the parliament, for example, as a representative of the citizens, got stronger. But I think this is a win-win situation. And so uh, we try here now, um, as members of the Conference of the Future of Europe, really to convince every level, so the regional one, the national one, the government, uh, and the European one, then we should from the result of the citizens' panels, really select uh, enough projects to put for, uh, Europe forward. Uh, and so um, to overcome this power struggle uh, and to look also in the recommendation of the citizens. And therefore, for example, um, the question of having really a, a strong European Union on the international level to be more sovereign uh, on the international level is one of the hardly um, claimed um, propositions, uh, and also um, to look at the uh, model how we can ensure for the future uh, more working places, uh, good jobs uh, with a future-proof perspective, um, good education to be fit uh, on, on the job uh, and fit also for changes uh, on the job market, but also uh, on the um, overall situations. Um, so I, I think we can really use now uh, this position of front runners 
uh, front runners as liberals because it was a renewed group who was putting it through in the negotiations. Uh, but we had backing and we had partners here in Parliament, so the Parliament really is also a front runner in this situation. Uh, and we should take this opportunity now that we have the tool with the conference on the future of Europe and that we have more and more governments who are ambitious on this question of reforming ourselves. Um, this is um, now the French presidency and um, President Macron had a really good speech. Ilan was present uh, and we are that's of the Renew Group, of course, also uh, in the uh, hemicycle of the European Parliament. But we have now also uh, in Berlin uh, a big change because there is now a government which wants to be proactive uh, on the European level. When before I would have described the big coalition in Germany more as a sleeping giant uh, without answers uh, to the proposals, not only coming from Paris, but especially from Paris. So we have now a coalition treaty of the new German government, which uh, especially uh, claims that this conference of the future of Euro has to be a success and especially claims um, strengthening European Parliament as a representative of the European citizens. And I think we should take these two possibilities now with the tool of the conference to go forward. Uh, I think we have especially the chance in this topic, which was also here voted as one of the most important um, to get uh, a solution on that. We see that really a foreign affairs, common security, is a uh, topic which nobody of our member states can solve at its own. Um, and we have, uh, I think, the opportunity now and also the necessity uh, to formulate more common strategies uh, on towards Russia, towards China, uh, towards other topics uh, on, uh, on, on in this domain, uh, and then to give uh, our um, high representative really a strong mandate to act so that he becomes more and more a sort of foreign minister for the European Union with a qualified majority voting in the council, of course, but really going forward. So that's this just as an example, because this was the highest in the votings um, in the polls uh, quite yet. Um, I think um, that we have the chance, but we have also the duty now to deliver. We will not be able to take every proposition from the citizens on board, uh, but we see where the weight is in the propositions. I really uh, hope, and this is not for granted, we have to work on it, but I really hope and I will work for that we have uh, good political conclusions uh, from um, the discussions in the conference on the future of Europe, that the result of these conclusions will be an action plan maybe with short-term, middle-term and long-term projects, but really with projects we want to realize. And then at the end, I have a dream. I have the dream that these conference could be the kickoff for a convent on the European constitution. I know that a lot of member states have problems with these constitutional questions. And maybe we have first um, to... Uh, tackle um, the easier topics uh, which are in the list um, of the proposals. Uh, but when we have realized those, I'm really hoping that we also go for this dream to have a European constitution which puts the citizens and not the institutions in the center of our work so that these constitutions is starting with the citizens' rights and then defining our institutional work and not the other way around, like, for example, in the Lisbon Treaty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Really appreciate your, your, your comments there. I'm now going to go back to Alexander um, and, you know, posing the sort of open question to you, uh, Alexander, how can rethinking EU democracy contribute to strengthening EU's position on the global stage. And that's very much speaking to the uh, majority that we saw tonight of people who see that as an important role uh, as we've seen from, from our earlier poll. So the floor is yours again, Alexander. This is, this is uh, I'll be brief on this uh, occasion because this is 
there's only one term that really connects the two, the internal democracy and our external role, and that is credibility. If we want to work for the values of human rights, of the rule of law, of democracy, of good governance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, it is absolutely crucial that we live these values domestically, i.e. inside the EU, both at the national and at the European levels. And um, when, you know, I've been active in, in election observation missions in Asia, in Africa, and, you know, very often it's, it's you know, the, the way people look at us and, and the image the European Union has is one of um, a functioning democracy. But then when, when things started to go awry in, in, in Hungary, you know, the first people came and asked, well, you know, there are, this, is, this is not going well and that is not going well and you're not living up to your own values. So why uh, do you believe you would be credible in telling us uh, how we should uh, run our countries? And, and, and so therefore, enhancing our global role presupposes, presupposes a functioning and a strengthening of our democracy. And some of the issues that have just been mentioned, Ilhan, for example, mentioned the European lists. I prefer European lists to transnational lists. Transnational, uh, to me, sounds so technocratic, but a European list, uh, that, that's something that I, I mean, you know, I used transnational, Ilhan, don't take it uh, uh, the wrong way. I used transnational lists for years until I noticed that people don't know what, what we mean by that. But when we say European lists, they, they instantly understand. So this is something, for example, if we manage to do this for the next European elections, it's it's going to add an element of European democracy to our fabric. And I think that's the, uh, how we strengthen our democracy and how we strengthen our credibility, which in turn enhances our global role. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. So I'm now going to ask uh, Helmut Brandstadter, who's an, M an MP, to deliver his um, introductory remarks. Those of you who don't know Helmut, he's a member of the Austrian National Council since 2019 with responsibility for foreign policy, research, innovation, and technology. And indeed, he is now as a spokesperson and coordinator uh, on these issues. Um, prior to that, uh, Helmut was a journalist from 2010 to 2019. He worked at the Daily Newspaper Courier, uh, first as publisher, and after that as editor-in-chief. And in addition, he was has uh, authored uh, several publications. So, Helmut, the floor is yours. And we're going to ask you to talk about, as we've already identified for you, what is the role of the EU to ensure a cyber-resilient post-pandemic recovery and how we can benefit from new technologies in building this resilience? Helmut. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to uh, start with a citation of uh, Václav Havel. He said, Democracy ties the hands of those who take democracy seriously. And obviously he lived in pre-digital times, but in digital times, this is even more the case. And of course, we had a hybrid wars uh, in, uh, in, in pre-digital times. And uh, I was a correspondent for Austrian television in Germany in the 1980s. And I followed uh, a lot of uh, peace demonstrations. Later on, we found out uh, uh, that um, the Soviet Union uh, even uh, took um, terrorists to the east and tried to uh, to uh, give them arms and whatever to attack in kind of a hybrid war uh, the West. And one of the guys who did it, by the way, um, and there's an interesting book I'm just reading. Um, it was Vladimir Putin when he was living in Dresden. It's a book called, I read in German, Putin's Nets, Putin's Net probably. And that describes it quite well, the way of hybrid wars which we had in the analog time, but in the digital time, of course, it's much more complicated, much more dangerous. And when I look at all those um, cyber attacks of the last years, uh, if it was the Austrian foreign ministry, uh, if it was Norway, um, if it was some uh, elections or uh, the Irish, um, uh, uh, an Irish system of health, public health system, I think it was, so that we know uh, that th these are these um, uh, cyber war, it's existing, what can we, do against it. And I like the remark of Alexander when he said, um, uh, these Western societies, we are a provocation uh, to, um, to authoritarian societies. And as we see it right now, 
uh, to, to Russia, for instance. I was in, in Kiev a few weeks ago, uh, and if you talk to people, they just they want to live like us, more or less, and they want to not live the way uh, Putin wants them to live. Uh, so we have, we have to help there as well. And that's what, uh, what Ilan says, and I also like that very much. It's a question of safety, and democracy and, um, and security is not for granted. So we have to do something for it. Uh, what can we uh, do for it? Uh, sovereignty, as Nicola said, sovereignty in many fields, but also in the fields uh, of the technology. We need a kind of technological sovereignty. And that's what uh, Ursula von der Leyen said in the European Cyber Resilience Act. She wants that, we have to work for that. I think it's important. But we also have to take in consideration that we are uh, not front runners as far as that's concerned. There is also an interesting book by Kai Fu Li, a Chinese um, who was educated in the States and then worked for Google in, in China. Um, and it, it's about uh, artificial intelligence. And he writes about China. He writes about the US, obviously. On, on one page, he writes about Europe, uh, that we have no chance as far as um, uh, artificial intelligence is concerned. So there is a lot of research to do. And if we want technological sovereignty, I think that's what you have to fight for. And uh, if people, and everyone, that's what we saw, if it's a question of um, EU role on the global stage, of course, it's a political question, but it's also a question of information and the way of disinformation, which we also learned during the COVID crisis, I think was very, very dangerous for us. And uh, we also have to think about it. How can we uh, shield ourselves uh, against uh, those attacks and those attacks will come again. They will come as far as information is concerned, but they will also come, um, uh, as far as uh, this uh, hybrid voice is concerned, uh, there's um, uh, these so-called logic bombs, you know, those sleeper viruses, and we know they are, they, they try to put them in our systems. Uh, so what is our way of helping each other? It only can be the European way, as always, we have to uh, work together on that field again. And last uh, sentence, but I always uh, try to say it because I think it's so uh, important. Um, uh, when I, I wrote the last book uh, last year about uh, Europe, um, I called it last week, I called for Europe, I needed certain data. And you get any data if you go to those websites of the European Commission. Um, and there's one more thing, but how about the motion? Uh, I think Alexander just talked about, uh, uh, about our values. Why don't we talk more about our values? That's, that's how I think uh, we get the young people. These values, you can live in Europe in a few other uh, states around the world, but especially in Europe, you only have fear. And we have it out of our history. We know our history. And for me, it's still a very emotional thing to be European since the time when I was a stagiaire in 1981 in Brussels. Um, uh, I'm this dedicated European because I know the history. I know what we're living right now. And I think that's our chance. Safety on the one hand, hand side, but also these values and give people the emotion that this is the best place you can live for on earth with all our possibilities we have here, but we have to defend them. Thank you very much. Helmut, thank you so much for your, your insight. We really appreciate that. Um, I'm now going to call for some questions. I have some here and I'm just going to throw one to each of our panelists just so to, to, to get you started. And then we'll, we'll feed into some more questions that have just, just have just come in and are coming in and I'll open them up to all. So, so first of all, uh, Nicola, could I ask you, how do you think policymakers uh, bring the EU closer to citizens? I think we have a lack of European media. Uh, we have a lot of journalists here in Brussels and in Strasbourg, but these are all national ones. So um, they're always looking uh, with a national perspective um, and often I know that and know that um, it's not their fault that the um, European information gets not through in in the national um, TV channels or in the press, uh, because often we are a little bit before the discussion in the member states. Yes, because we make the framework, which is then um, detailed in the member states to harmonize uh, what is happening in, in our common union. Uh, and so uh, I would really appreciate if we, for example, um, take Arte, which is uh, which started as a French-German project, now has 11 
uh, different uh, participation and collaboration partners um, all over the European Union, really um, to a European media, uh, so that uh, people can inform themselves directly and not filtered uh, by the national um, input. Um, I think this would make it easier to be more transparent because I know how much we do, uh, for example, on the website of the European Parliament to inform people and citizens to come in contact to install the citizens digital citizen platform. And we are discussing even to go further also, uh, also um, after the Conference of Future has ended. Um, but uh, all this comes not through. And I think we also should use the normal uh, information channels um, which bring the information and not only are presenting and waiting that somebody is taking them off. So uh, my wish would be really have European media in the European Union so that you have uh, direct information of what is done here in Brussels, in Strasbourg, by the representatives, by the Council, by the, uh, by the Commission of Four Citizens in Europe. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, now, Alexander, I'm going to ask you uh, to evaluate, I suppose, the idea and chances for a direct election uh, of the President of the European Commission as a contribution for more democratic institutions. And that's coming from Stefan in Belgium. That, that would be the end of a longer development. I think we um, should start with strengthening direct elections where we have them. And that's the European Parliament. Um, one should not forget that a direct election to a position of a presidency or so um, should that take place, creates the expectation of an enormous amount of power that comes with this immediate act of democratic, uh, democratic legitimization. And so, therefore, um, I would propose not to, you know, put this idea front and center now, but to keep it, if you want, in our quiver for a later stage um, and uh, focus for now on the European lists for the European Parliament. It's... Um, uh, an idea that was discussed uh, um, a couple of years ago in the context of the European, uh, 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 the, the, the creation of the double presidency when the European Council received a, a, a permanent presidency. Um, but uh, I think we're not there yet uh, uh, as far di as direct uh, elections are concerned for the presidency. Okay, thank you. Um, and to Dr. Barnster, uh, so from Emil uh, from North Man uh, Macedonia, uh, and his words, not mine. Today, Europe is gone. Mobile phone and electric car brands are American and Chinese. How to revive Europe's lead in global markets by top research and development across borders? Discuss. Uh, that's, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, I'll, I'll try to answer, but first I want to say uh, two sentences to, to Nicola because she talked about the media. And, you know, I've, I've been uh, a long time a journalist. It's got to be a story, you know, if it's a good story, journalists will write about it. And I think there's, there are two things and politicians have to explain it better. First, and, and, and also, of course, the, uh, the, the national politician. First of all, where are the advantages? Why is it good for our citizens that we are part of Europe? I get a lot of mails and also on Facebook, people write, get out of European new, uh, community, uh, community, nobody needs it. And if you write back, um, how how um, how much our PIP you know um, is uh, was rising after we we are member and how important it is for an expert nation like Austria? They say, okay, I didn't know that. But the other thing is, I also think we have to explain where are the dangers, why it is dangerous if Europe falls apart. What does it mean? Um, you know, Mitterrand said, "Le nationalisme c'est la guerre." And I know um, I know it from um, from. Um, uh, yeah, people of my age shouldn't talk about about. Uh, I, I wasn't in the war, obviously, but my my father was there, and, and we know what happened there. And we have to tell the the young people. And you know, if, if you grew up in Yugoslavia, you know what it means uh, if if there is a war. We know what's in Ukraine. If there is a war in Ukraine, there are going to be a lot of refugees in 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 Europe. So we have to do everything uh, in order that there is no war there. And we have to explain it probably easier than we do it until now. And the second question is, is the huge question about, about uh, research. Um, 
And you know, um, if if you know that all the the, the big success of research, um, if it is at Silicon Valley or is, if it is famous a chip company in Taiwan, TSCM, of course it was a public money. It was uh, uh, money from the state, a lot of money invested in order uh, to get uh, better research. Um, and uh, um, and TSCM today they 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 produce the fastest and best chips on the world that even the Chinese needed. Uh, so we. Uh, we have to invest. I mean, there's this Chips Act now. I hope this is successful. I think we have to invest more public money in research. We have to see where is the future in research. And as I said, one of those is uh, um, is uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which I think is, is very important. And it's also, we have now the COVID crisis. I mean, it, the, the, it's genius has found out this, this vax. And uh, um, uh, I talked to, to a lot of researchers here about the next step, what is what are they going to find out about cancer? Because this MR, mRNA um, research does help also vaccination against cancer. And Europeans are part of it. Um, but, uh, and we don't, and, and it's one more, <laughs> one more point. We don't talk enough about it. Okay, but to, to the, this Turkish couple who came to Germany, thank you very much. And they helped us out and they did a lot, uh, did great research. We have to talk more about it, why, why we do it, what we do. And also say that we need more public money and more public spending. And also we have, it's a diff probably different for liberals, but uh, the Americans are liberals and the, <laughs> there's a lot of money in Silicon Valley, um, uh, taxpayers' money. Um, and as I said, in Taiwan, it's the same case. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Um, so I, I'm, I'm now going to go to some of the other questions. Just first of all, I, I want to apologize to my dear friend, uh, Manfred Eisenbach, who had a difficulty, um, well, he had a difficulty, but I think it was an hour and some technical issues about uh, about uh, his, his capacity to vote, um, and hopefully we'll capture uh, his thoughts. Um, at the, there will be another poll l later on. On the questions that I see on the Q&A there, we've one from uh, Manfred Hanek. There's a question where he's looking for an answer. One of the more obvious reasons why many people in the EU are sceptical about the ever closer union uh, is the impression that the Commission is micromanaging, creating too many detailed rules. Wouldn't it help if the EU regulations, similar to the directives, became principle-based instead of rules-based? So I'll pop that to you, Nicola. I'll, I'll get each of the three contributors, but Nicola, I'll throw that one to you first, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think there is a lot of truth in this question. Um, I would not only um, link it to the sort of regulation. Uh, I think we have really to look over the competencies. Uh, and we are not strong in those where we cannot act all, uh, alone. So like um, foreign and security policies. And we are acting often uh, much more detailed in cases I would leave not even to the member states, so, the, so to the national level, but even to the regional level, because they are closer to the citizens. So to, to look if we have shuffled it on the right level, I think would be the first thing to do. And then he is totally right. Um, it, it's important to have as a union some principles and then to go through all the different topics in the member state to, to spell them out, um, then to have a detailed regulation uh, and the sort of regulation uh, have the most of problem the, uh, with are the delegated acts um, because there even European Parliament cannot intervene to make the proposition of the commission better um, we can only say yes or no. We have to take it as a package. Uh, and then this, for example, in the in the ongoing discussion for the taxonomy, makes it quite difficult um, to spell out what your European citizens, um, as far as I see it, wants to have as a result. Okay. Thanks very much, um, Nicola. Uh, Alexander, would you like to comment on yeah. that question? Briefly, I basically agree with what Nicola said. There are exceptions, though. There are, for example, um, certain things in the single market where if you want to ensure fair competition across the member states, you need to make sure that uh, the same uh, rules apply. Um, and uh, then in these cases, I believe it is better to have a clear set of rules that everybody can uh, uh, apply and that our companies, play, for example, do not have to learn 27 different national 
uh, sets of rules. Um, that is a point where I would say uh, under a single market perspective, from a single market perspective, sometimes it's better to have clear rules for everyone um, rather than principles that can be uh, uh, modified in the national, at the national level. But this is always a case-by-case -case decision. And the subsidiarity principle that Nicola just mentioned, i.e. looking at you know, whether the decisions are taken as close to the citizen as uh, reasonable and possible, um, should go both ways, by the way. We have that in our coalition agreement here in Germany. We have a reverse subsidiarity clause. Uh, what we say is, well, are there issues that we shouldn't be dealing with at the national level? Wouldn't it be better if we did it at the European level? So the subsidiarity check has to go both ways. And I think that's, that's uh, um, where Mr. Hanich's idea comes uh, in, you know, principles-based versus rules-based. Thanks very much, uh, Alexander. Um, Helmut, would you like to give us your thoughts on that question? I think everything you said, no, I, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. You, 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 you're good. You've covered that. So I'm now going to try to introduce some uh, video contribution um, from those that have been in touch with us. Um, I believe we have a video question coming in from Ricardo Silvestre. Uh, so I'm depending on the technical team from, from the Alde Secretariat to introduce that. Uh, so I await see if we can get that on screen. There we go. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Technology is a great thing. Um, my name is Ricardo. I'm from Lisbon and Portugal. And thank you so much for all the party and FNF for organizing this, but particularly for the opportunity of this interaction. I'm going to be very, very quick. And it's a privilege to have some of your time and attention. And actually, it's not the first time that I talk with one of you because I had Ilham on the European Liberal Podcast, the European Liberal Forum Project. And Ilham, you're always welcome back. So I would love to have you back on the pod. And now the question, as I said, is very quickly, but in my opinion, very, very important. And it relates to the EU in the world as, as a strong power. And that is, we need to fix our house. That is clear. We talked about this. We have Russia, we have China, all that is very, uh, very true and very important. But I have a concern that we may have a major constitutional crisis and political chaos, if nothing, if nothing more, even worse than that, in the United States in 2024 in, and even before that. So because Iliam and Nicola are in the Committee of, Committee of Foreign Affairs, even as substitutes, do you guys know if we're preparing for this? Like, for example, in Canadian media, there are some articles already what Canada should do if that happens. Are we, in your opinion, thinking about that? What can we do? What should we do? Is there anything we can do? So that'll be my question. And as you notice by my accent, I have a very close relationship with the United States, and I'm very, very worried of what's happening with one of our major partners and friends. Thank you. Elan, well, do you want to go first, as you are a Please, member Nicola, yes, thank you. Hi, Mott, or? <laughs> Please, Nicola, I was just turning on my microphone. You, you, you got in ahead of me. Well done. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, yes, this is a really important question, and I think um, all the facets of sovereignty are important, but especially on this topic. And we saw it, I think, already with the Trump administration. Uh, for a term of a um, president which was not accepting that multilateralism is a solution and not a problem, uh, who went uh, on the international stage um, very aggressively towards even his partners, his value partners, uh, who had um, from one moment to the other um, close contacts and relations with those aggressors. Uh, for which we try really um, to say, for example, the sovereignty also of the Ukraine or other partners who want to decide on their destiny themselves, um, for me, was uh, the proof 
that what we are wishing um, to have a more sovereign um, quicker acting um, European Union on this topic is important. So for example, to build up a European pillar in NATO. So this doesn't mean that we want to weaken NATO or that we do not need our Western um, value partners, uh, but to have an own and strong um, uh, pillar in NATO uh, to invest in common uh, in our security on the cyber and on also on the ground uh, is for me a very important um, uh, point. And we have also to look not only over the Atlantic, but also on the Asian part. So to have a common strategy on Asian countries, for example, uh, to search for uh, our value partners uh, in, on the Asian continent, to have a common strategy and not 27 different ones on Africa. Uh, so a continent where we see where, that there is already the race, uh, especially from the Chinese, uh, but to build up uh, democracies there and to have a win-win situation uh, with those countries to help them to install the African Union, uh, also to make them stronger uh, uh, on the markets, uh, is, in my opinion, something which is not only stabilizing the situation in the world, but it's also stabilizing uh, our future possibilities for growth and wealth uh, for our citizens. Thanks very much, Nicola. I'm just going to have to ask you to excuse the sound in the background when I'm online because there's I'm, I'm in the Parliament buildings and there's a vote being called. I'm OK, I don't have to go to this one. I'm prepared, but that is the... That is the bell tolling, all right. Um, Alexander, do you wanna, wanna have a shot at that question? Uh, I, I'll happily pass it to Ilhan who has raised his hand, but uh, not without congratulating our Portuguese friends for the brilliant election result. I mean, incredible. Increasing your membership of parliament eightfold. Okay, you started with one, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I mean, we were so happy to see that now with eight MPs, that gives liberalism in Portugal, I think, for the first time, a real structure. It's, it's great. So, Ricardo, thumbs up to you, but I'll pass on the uh, answer to, to Ilhan uh, because he's, waiting, he's been waiting for that, if that's yeah, okay to me. Apologies, I didn't see Ilhan's hand up. But, I think, uh, Timmy, I, I, think Ilhan, was technically, I think it was technically raised by the... Uh, people from the secretariat, but uh, uh, I don't have to add much because already Nicola gave a good overview uh, uh, to the question. But again, Initiativa Liberal, as Alexander said, uh, made a great result, so looking forward. Not to complicate your, your moderation, Timmy. <laughs> Thank you, Ilhan. Really appreciate that. We're, we're, we're working well on this one. Um, Dr. Bernstetter, you want to answer that? Yeah. Uh, muito obrigado. Gosto de Lisboa. Huh? That's what I wanted to say at the beginning. Um, I think that's is a very good point for that, what I said before, but advantages and dangers. We have to explain to the European public where the dangers are. And this is a very dangerous situation. Um, we don't know what's happening in the United States, but we all read what's happening in, in, in different uh, uh, um, uh, um, parts of the United States. And so we have to explain to the Europeans that if we talk about safety, we have to talk about European safety. And that means that we have to do, it, to do it together. And Austria is a neutral country. Our neutrality made sense in 1955. But today we have to define it new. It's a completely different situation. And today it means, and NEOs are very much in favor of a European army, but it has, you can't build an army from one day to the other but you have to have much better cooperation until, uh, until now. And this is something which we also have to explain emotionally. We are in danger if, if something happens in the United States with the president who says, I don't care about Europe anymore. So what do we do? We have to organize ourselves much better. And we are strong. We can do much more. Um, uh, we, we, we can, sp if for the same money we spend now, we can get much better arms and much better uh, uh, much better research also as, as far as arms are concerned if you do it in cooperation. But I think we have to explain it to the public and say where's the advantage, but also where's the danger. And I think it's very dangerous um, if the situation as you described it, and it's a possible uh, situation if that happens. Not, not, to, not, not to say people, we have to be afraid. No, no, we don't have to be afraid if you do the right thing. If you don't do the right thing, it might be a dangerous situation for Europe. Thank you. Thanks very much, Helmut. Uh, now we're going to go to uh, it's a kind of a different question, but it's interesting. 
Uh, we have Roman Jadik uh, online, and I think he's. We're also going to be able to patch uh, Roman in by way of a video link. So, I'm going to see if we can do that. So, if you just bear with us, and we'll see if our back end technical people can reach the far flung regions of Slovenia if, if Roman's not snowed in there at the moment. <laughs> now I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah, but there's certainly the uh, the cold isn't getting to you over there. Anyway, you got the sleeves rolled up. You're either shoveling out the, the snow or you're <laughs> you're on the beach somewhere. Yes, uh, the Slovene press agency and Nicole and uh, Ilhal will know this is the symbol of fight for the free media in Slovenia. So I put no, it no, I put no, it this no, uh, no, as the protest. But uh, you're thank very you. welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being yeah. with us this evening, Roman. It's 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 nice. Uh, it's nice to see friendly faces and. Uh, friends uh, uh, and true liberals. Uh, uh, the question, I, I, I will maybe go a little bit to different direction, but probably ex expected that I will uh, put the question to uh, Nicole, uh, Nicola and Alexander about uh, the future of Europe and the Balkans. So the future of Europe in the, uh, uh, in the future of all of Europe, not just the uh, European Union. At the time um, of uh, reproachment and negotiation with the EU, Slovenia, my country, was lucky uh, that uh, Germany was, um, and particularly the, the liberals, uh, the, the Mr. Genscher, Otto von Lambsdorff, and, and, and the others were our active sponsor. Even now, the eyes of the Western Balkan countries and the expectation of help uh, are turned to Germany and its uh, new government. Uh, so can our colleagues in the Southeast uh, region, and uh, we, you probably know we are uh, working in Lipsen, uh, uh, this, this group of the liberals from Southeast region, can we expect uh, Germany to play an active role in the uh, EU enlargement? That's my question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So uh, to our two German colleagues, you want to kick off there, Nicola? Yes, um, but Alexander is a little bit nearer by as far as the German government is concerned. And uh, uh, But I can say also because I was part of the negotiating team for the coalition treaty um, that there are the eyes on the Western Balkans uh, and that we really um, want to reach two things. The first is to reform in the Western Balkans so that you can join European Union. And the second is also to reform European Union so that the, the European Union is capable to integrate more member states. Because we see with the procedures we have for the moment, it is uh, already difficult for 27. Uh, and uh, so become um, wider means also that we have to become uh, better uh, in what we are doing. Um, this is not because I saw this in one of the questions. This is not the every closer union. I think we should have an ever better union. Uh, and this means also to focus uh, in, in, some, uh, in some concerns. Um, so yes, uh, I think we have it really um, on the agenda. Uh, I'm not now involved in what was done um, since we formed this government. This is more a question for Alexander, um, who is also a spokesperson um, uh, in, in, in this uh, behalf. Uh, but I think it's really Im important um, that European Union is not the end of Europe, um, that we give the possibility to join the club, uh, as I would say it, uh, but that this has also criteria. So for the Copenhagen criteria, um, because we have a common base, um, which has to be signed. Uh, and uh, we see how difficult it is if we have member states which uh, are ignoring after the signature the common base. Uh, Alexander already, already uh, raised the question of Hungary, uh, Poland and other states. Uh, but so for uh, joining, uh, it's important to re be, be really on the level um, of all those rules uh, which are um, formulated in the Copenhagen criteria. Um, Alexander? Yeah. Roman, I, I can be very brief. Yes. <laughs> Your question was, will the German government play an active role? Yes. If you look to the coalition agreement, uh, we have a full paragraph devoted to the Western Balkans. It's right after the paragraph on France and Poland. So you see there's a, 
the mindset. Britain comes afterwards, okay? So Britain, they they completely you know different different ballgame because you're going in and they have left. So everything has changed in a way there, and so it, it it's very clear um, there is a support for the accession procedure. There is uh, uh, um, visa liberalization with Kosovo. Uh, there's opening of chapters with Albania, Northern Macedonia. Um, there is a, a picking up again of the negotiations uh, with uh, Serbia and Montenegro. So, so there's a very detailed uh, uh, text really about the Western Balkans by the standards of a coalition agreement. Uh, this is a broad agreement that covers everything uh, and cannot go into total detail, but uh, it's, it's there. Having said all that, there are two aspects that I should mention as well. One Serbian politics is is worrying. Uh, it, it's, there's absolutely no doubt about it, both their foreign policy orientation and domestic dynamics. And uh, of course, the situation in, in, in Bosnia, um, while we would hope for stabilization and, and consolidation um, and a constitutional process in some way that would lead to a, 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 a sort of solidified Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, what we're seeing right now is a Mr. Dodik who's doing more or less whatever he wants. And, and, and so we, we are faced with domestic dynamics in some of the countries that, doesn't, that, that don't make it particularly easy. And um, it's a responsibility, that's why I'm pointing it out, of course, of the countries to put themselves in that situation that they are sort of capable of you know, embarking on a path uh, towards membership that is serious and uh, that, you know, the door is open, the commitment is there, and we will play an active role. Thank you very much, both of you. Yeah, really appreciate the question um, and the answers. Now, I'm going to move to another video question, I believe, from Uli Henson. So back to the, the people who are holding all this together, if you can get Uli on board. If we're having a difficulty getting Uli in, I'll just give it another minute. If not, we'll just I'll I'll, I'll ask the question because it is in the, the question lineup. Um, bear with me. See if we can get Uli online. Uli, I think you're in. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. I'm going to a <clears throat> pretty basic question, actually. Um, regarding democracy and what Nicola Bear said. Uh, first of all, we have to think about how uh, decisions in the EU are perce perceived by the people living in the EU. And I'm kind of, uh, yeah, I'm not happy with the fact that Ursula von der Leyen became head of the Europe European Commission while actually no voter, no voter thought that she is a candidate. She didn't participate in the election. She was, uh, she was Minister of Defense in Germany, failing big time actually. And uh, she became head of the European Commission while at the same time, the Brexiteers claimed that the, EU, uh, that the EU is undemocratic. So we appoint someone to the basically highest position who didn't stand for election. And I think that uh, that's not uh, what a democracy should look like. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing regarding democracy is, uh, is the classic. Um, we have uh, likely 20% uh, women in political parties or 25. Now, if you have the goal on having 50% women representation, that means that women are privileged towards men by the factor of 2.5, which is pretty unfair. And considering that there are basically only laws that privilege women, uh, it sounds uh, basically insane. Um, there is no law that privileges men, no. So there's no reason to claim that we need more women and discriminate against men for it. And to make one thing abundantly clear, if one group is underrepresented in one area, it doesn't mean that this group is disadvantaged because the same group has may have a higher representation in another level. For example, prosecutors, German prosecutors, the majority of new ones are female. Now, is it disadvantageous for men? Certainly not, if less men go for it. 
less women are in politics and in parliament. Does it mean that they are disadvantaged? Certainly not, if less women go for it. So we need to go away from this insane uh, ideology of having 50-50 in every, every area, because in reality, it's always like support women, ignore men, wherever women are less than 50%. Um, that's one thing. And it pretty much sounds like communism, because if I don't get to uh, choose in which area I want to work, because more men went to this area before, then I don't have freedom of choice on what area I want to work in. And it's the same for companies as well. If, if somebody decides we need more women in, I don't know, controlling, then a man has less chances just because more men decided to go for controlling. We don't do the same the other way around. Is it discriminating against men that the majority of teachers is female? Do we say, oh, it's discriminating against men? No. Okay, so, Uli. I think I think we have your I, I think we have the the, the gist the, yeah, the I'm gist quite of your mad about this because it basically just no, I, I wanted to no I can I, I I can understand I can I can understand I can understand your point but um I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up but but I think we, we've got to be careful um I would just say from the outset that there's a big difference between the role of a prosecutor and that of a politician um it's my view and it dis may, may be a disadvantageous to me in my career but at the end of the day, whatever form we seek uh, to serve in, I think we can only have true equality when men and women are equal in terms of the representation. It's, it's not so much or cannot be seen as just because women don't put themselves forward. Um, it, 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 it has been, in my view, difficult for women to engage in, in politics for many reasons, which I don't intend to get into here. But I think as a, as a civil society, where particularly coming as we do from, from a liberal party, we've got to, in my view, create every opportunity to bring people from all sides to the table. Because at the end of the day, society will be benefited by having a broad cross-representation of people from minorities, um, and certainly uh, across Europe, across the world, men and women are in equal numbers. And I think it would be uh, it would be wrong of us not to continue with the quest to try to ensure that we have an equality uh, of, 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 of numbers across the genders um, in representative politics. Because at the end of the day, the politicians are attempting to put in place, uh, you know, the fundamental building blocks for society um, at all levels, and that can only be enhanced by having uh, an equality of esteem uh, across the board. So I, I would have to say, Uli, um, and I don't say this lightly, I would disagree fundamentally with the position uh, that you that you have advanced. But I'm going to open it up to our our our, our guests um, to to talk. So so Nicola. No better person than yourself to address that question initially. Yeah, thank you. As I'm the, the female quota here on that panel. Um, I will take one question after the other. First question on the uh, Ursula von der Leyen case. Yes, of course, it was disappointing. It was disappointing, I think, for every voter. It was especially disappointing um, for us as a liberal family because we went for Margrethe Westhager as our Spitzenkandidat in the Team Europe we built for the European election, as there were no European lists existing. We have these European team um, to, to make visible that we have European solution and not only uh, nationalists. Um, it went out because the treaties made it possible. There was no majority for Margrethe in the council. There was no majority for the other heads of the list. Um, of the um, different parties in the council. And then it turned out um, that uh, von der Leyen in a package with four other um, functions of the top jobs came out as a result. I think we have to prevent this for the next election. And this is why we are going um, for having a combination of the European list with the Spitzenkandidat model. This doesn't mean that the strongest European party gets the seat of the president of the commission but that there has to be a majority within the parliament 
I hope to be it within the parliament or at least uh, in the council for one of those who were really running for the elections and not nowhere. Uh, so this is for your first question, but this will have, we are fighting for a majority for this in the conference on the future of Europe. And for the second question, which would fill, uh, be able to fill up really a uh, whole evening on that, um, maybe so far. I'm now here working um, after having experiences on the regional level, on the national level, now on the European level. I'm working in a parliamentarian group which has uh, 48 women out of 101. And this makes something in policy making. Uh, I know it from the regional and from the national level with the 55 or maybe 30 percent um, you were quoting. Uh, and I think we have, uh, as I'm not a fan of uh, mandatory quotas, but we have to think it over why in a 50-50 society there are not enough women going for politics, for example. I'm mentoring uh, in a mentoring program uh, for women uh, over 15 years now. And I know um, that the reasons are really diverse, uh, but I see that the result is better if we have really gender equality. I'm not going for disadvantaging one of the genders. I'm just searching for a way to make it easy um, to have the access for uh, really good people. Uh, and I think it's a mixture of that. So it's a question of gender equality. Uh, I'm going for and looking about the different reasons why gender equality in the different parts um, we were um, citing uh, are not yet uh, fulfilled. This can, in one term, goes for the female sex and in the other one, uh, for example, I was always championing for more male colleagues uh, in education system because I think that is an important role model uh, for all our children from the little ones up to the elder ones. Uh, so that we have a really sound mixture in that. And this has to be uh, worked out uh, without mandatory quota, uh, but with really good models to make it easier for a man to work in a kindergarten and for a woman uh, to have a high position in politics. Thanks very much, Nicola. And si si I'm recognizing now that we have about 10 or 12 minutes to wrap up um, and we've quite a few questions. So I'm going to proceed on and I'm not going to I'm not going to ask each of the panelists to answer each question. So I'm just going to divide it up as we go. So I'll, I'll, I'll thank you for that one, Nicola. The next um, question that I see that's somewhat interesting uh, from Jessica Elanco. Uh, Macron is replacing Merkel as the leader. What are the risks and opportunities? So I'm going to go to our Austrian friend to answer that rather than put either of our two German colleagues on the spot. So, um, Helmut, you might take that question, please. So, Macron is replacing Merkel as the leader. What are the risks and opportunities? I'm sorry, I really didn't answer. What are the risks of Argentina of being what kind of leader? No, what are the risks and opportunities from Macron replacing Merkel as effectively the European uh, leader? <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm called Mitterrand generation, uh, and it was fascinating uh, to watch uh, those two people. And of course, we always said uh, Germans and, and French have to work together. Um, uh, but I also always quote um, uh, the, the, the quote that says, Paul uh, uh, Henri who said, uh, in, in Europe, there are only small nations and small nations who don't yet know that they are small nations. So, uh, of course, Germany speak, uh, France speak, but... Um, no, uh, they both are not big enough to, to lead Europe alone. So I think we need Germany and, and, and France, but we need all, um, we need all the other uh, countries to work together. And it's, all, of course, also a question of, of personality. Um, let's uh, wait and see. Macron made a, a, a great uh, election, pro-European election campaign uh, last time. Um, I hope you'll do. Uh, the same, and then he will be very important. But uh, I remember his speech. Was it the, the speech at the university um, where he talked about also the 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 force de frappe and uh, and possibilities to have it for Europe and together and so on and so forth. Very complicated, very complicated. He, I think, he has to be very clear, and then we have, we'll have the discussion how this European security uh, will uh, will uh, work out together. But it, but there is no one leader for Europe, so there's all the countries to work together. 
Yeah, great. Thanks very much. Uh, now I'm going to go to a question from Lesse Becker. And it's a question to Nicola and Ilhan. If Ilhan is online, I'll, I'll pass it to him since I've already had Nicola in. With regard to the remark that not enough European media presence, um, isn't it the EP itself, the European Parliament itself, that's limiting its visibility all over, over Europe by giving that many days in Brussels, Strasbourg, instead of an, uh, the electoral districts around Europe, the EP um, has a, a hundred session days more than the US Congress per year. If not, if, if I'm not mistaken, that's from Lesse. So, uh, Ilhan, you want to have a pop at that? Right. Uh, and yes, I, I do agree. Uh, this was one of our concerns uh, during the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, and our advice from the, from the Renew group was, uh, let's, let's build a man media strategy. Let's have a communication strategy if you want to explore the potential of our ideas. And not only to listen uh, the... Uh, the, the pro-European forces, but also to open a, a fora for anti-European forces if you want to go forward with, with key reforms. And here I would uh, strongly emphasize that uh, it's important to work with the uh, conventional media, as we say, uh, with uh, well-known uh, uh, outlets, but also uh, in, we live in a new reality. Uh, today, younger generation is in, is in TikTok, uh, is, on, you know, is on social media. So we have to uh, learn how to uh, engage with, with them as well. And uh, I'm sure Nico will mention it, but uh, we just finished uh, this week our uh, strategy, how to uh, work with the younger generation and how to build a real caucus and to engage with uh, uh, with the youngsters uh, when it comes to uh, 2024 elections. And for that, we need different tools. For that, we need uh, certainly a uh, different approach. And uh, we think uh, uh, that should be one of our aims uh, in tackling the problems, but also uh, giving opportunities. As was one of the main slogans uh, for FDP, uh, we have to make Europe a chance continent. We have to give uh, opportunities for younger generation. Thank you very much, Ilhan. And now we're going to go to another German contributor, um, my good friend, Rudy Rensler of FDP Germany. And Rudy has asked, how could we get the proposal of Macron on legal abortion in the Charter of Fundamental European Rights? And um, Alexander, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to try to respond to that if you can, please. Um. I'm not sure whether we should do that, actually. Uh, I believe that um, access to safe abortion is, is extremely important, but it is an immensely emotional, delicate issue that has to do, um, that, that is addressed in, in, in different countries in very different ways. Um, and therefore, I think um, this is something where the idea of subsidiarity comes in. It's not something that uh, I would uh, transfer to the European level. I mean, we, for example, have one country uh, fundamentally disagree with its policies, but, but Malta has a, a policy that's very different from ones of, of, of many other countries. Ireland has gone through a very remarkable process uh, of modernizing its, its law. But this is something where I believe that, that countries need to uh, find their own path. I think uh, um, imposing this from above would probably produce more resistance to a reasonable idea than if it's done at the national level in in, in, in a national context. And I say this as somebody who is who has always defended uh, sexual rights and reproductive health. Um, I think that is, is something that's that's absolutely crucial, um, and the freedom of a woman to choose. Um, but I think in terms of 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 the politics of it, I would not uh, try to move it to the European level. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to move to Sonia. I can't pronounce the second name, I'm just not getting it properly there. So ladies and gentlemen, democracy will be as strong as EU citizens will be, following with concerns, the latest developments in Russia's military buildup um, around Ukraine. I'm aware of the possible adverse consequences of the military conflict uh, for the whole of Europe, our common values, prosperity and stability. The Liberals should speak loud and clear, and in inverted commas, we do not want any, tree, any military conflict. And call on the European Council and the Council uh, to use their powers in pursuing the objectives 
uh, of the common foreign and security policy referred to in Article 21, paragraph 1 and 2 of the Treaty of the EU in accordance with the aims of the Charter of Paris to cooperate in defending democratic institutions against activities involving outside pressures, coercion and subversion. There will be no future of Europe. If we do not act right now, it is time to show whether the organization of the EU institutions is really effective. And the question is, is the LDA party going to organize some activity? Ilham, I'll throw that one back to you. Well, certainly we are planning uh, the, uh, good activities uh, around the topic. And uh, uh, you remember, Timmy, this was one of our main discussions in the, in the WASP bureaus, but also uh, I had a bilateral with you. And we are happy to move uh, forward the agenda. It's my short answer. Okay, thanks, Ilhan. Um, okay, so uh, Jessica has another question. Millions are fearful of and therefore against globalism. To many EU comes across as part of it. What do we do? Uh, Nicola? Um, yes, I know that there are a lot of concerns and fears, uh, but I think that the answer is what um, Helmut Brandstetter explained the whole um, evening, and that we have to explain um, that there is no alternative uh, ongoing um, in a multilateral way. And globalization is not nothing else than um, multilateralism. Uh, but we have to try to do it via treaties, via multilateral organizations, rule-based uh, and value-based. Uh, and so this is, for example, the, the reason why the new fair trade agreements um, have uh, sections about uh, rule of law, about um, climate um, protection, uh, about the standards uh, for safe work uh, in um, the production chain. Uh, and I think this is important um, that we have also um, uh, human rights uh, on that. So that there is clear common base of rules uh, for the exchange all over the globe. Uh, but the, we can clearly say um, that not only for European countries, but also for our partners abroad, uh, such a globalized multilateral way uh, was the base in the last uh, years um, for growth, for wealth, uh, and on both sides. And so to act in a responsible way, uh, also multilateral one, uh, is, I think, um, the future. And I'm quite happy that there were um, liberal commissioners uh, who um, developed this new generation um, of, uh, uh, for example, free trade agreements. And I'm really hoping um, that we go forward. Um, there was a question on the US. Uh, I think everybody would have loved if we had would have had uh, a treaty with the US on that uh, when um, Trump came into office. Uh, and so I think this is the future to explain what we are doing, uh, because I think um, this is the best alternative uh, what we develop in in the future time. May I add just one just one point? Uh, I think to foster regional organizations is important. You know, from Vienna, it's just an hour to Bratislava. If you live in Vorarlberg, you live in the Bodensee region. I think you have to explain and uh, better to people that they live in the region and they work together inside Europe and then they live in this region. It's not the, the nation, it's the re region where they live, where they have their, their, their relatives, their, their friends and, and, and where they have their jobs and so on and so forth. And I think that's that's growing slowly but surely, but it's important and it's I think it's a very good answer to the what people think danger of globalism. Now, ladies and gentlemen uh, and guests, uh, we didn't get a chance to do that final poll because I think we'd had such really good questions um, and I had a great contribution from our guest speakers. Um, I, I just want to draw this event to a conclusion to thank you so much for participating, all of you uh, who could be with us. Um, to Nicola, to Alexander and to Helmut, I want to sincerely thank you on behalf of myself and Ilhan as co-presidents of the ALDE party. I want to thank uh, Ilhan for his contribution earlier. Uh, and I really want to thank the ALDE secretariat and Danielle in particular for the work that she has done in bringing this event together. 
I think it, uh, it, it deserves a round of applause, which I'm sure we will all do in a virtual way. And it would be remiss of me also in concluding uh, not to recognize uh, the tremendous uh, work um, and effort that Hans Van Ballen, the late Hans Van Ballen, former president of, of the Alde Party, uh, did for uh, liberalism uh, and did for the Alde Party over many years. And, and also uh, for his own native um, VVD party. Uh, I think it's right and appropriate that these series of, of, of town hall events are named in his honour. So just draw it to a conclusion. Thank you so much. Really looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible participating uh, in the ALDE Congress, in person Congress, which will be held in my native Dublin uh, on June, between June 2nd and 4th. So we would uh, appeal to all of you uh, to bring that family together again uh, in the summer month of, of June in Dublin, where I can promise you we will give you a very warm welcome uh, and the, the Guinness will be flowing well over the course of the weekend. And whilst I know uh, it's, it's not necessary to teach Germans about beer, um, I, I hope to teach those of you who haven't visited about the great brew of Guinness uh, Stout. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.